Welcome to the underground, the Steel City Underground, the black and gold standard for Pittsburgh Steelers coverage. Now, here are your hosts, Joe Kuzma and Zach Meckler. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Steel City Underground, a daily Steelers grind edition for today, presented by the 2019 Legends of Pittsburgh Cruise with all of your favorite Pittsburgh legends on board, but also great entertainment to keep you smiling like other Pittsburgh natives, people like Chris Jamison, Chris Higby, Keita the Great, and many others sailing on the cruise in March. For more information, head on over to steelcityunderground.com slash legends cruise or book now at 877-381-5553. And don't forget to use the promo code SCU19 when booking. My name's Joe Kuzma, and I happen to still be wearing a smile heading into hump day this week. Not because of anything that happened on Monday, not because of anything that happened on Tuesday, not because it's hump day, but because of what happened on Sunday. And to join in my splendor, who also happened to be there to join in my splendor at Heinz Field, the one, the only, the professor, Zach Meckler. What's up, Zach yeah, Joe, I think it's going to take an awful lot at this point to get this smile off my face. I don't, I don't remember the last time I've been this just overly joyous of a Steelers win. Honestly, you probably have to go back to uh, 2009, the last time I felt this genuinely excited. You know, in this game, just a regular season game, but I'm not complaining one bit. You know, for those who haven't met Zach in person, <laughs> he... We were calling you a snuggly teddy bear earlier. You know, I don't know that your personality always comes off podcast wise. You kind of have like the monitor. You remind me of sometimes, don't take this the wrong way. The um, was that the farmer's insurance? We know a thing, we see a thing, like the like the monotone kind of thing. And and he's really excitable guy. And let me tell you, Zach ends up taking off his jersey and and flying it around helicopter style after the stop on fourth (laughs) down at the end of the game. And what was a raucous playoff at Atmosphere. I you if you weren't there, TV did not do it justice. It was wild. I mean, you couldn't hear a single thing. You know, I, I've been to quite a few Steelers games over the years, and I don't think I've been to one um, where the crowd was that loud. You know, I've seen sellout crowds. You know, I was at the Steelers Ravens Christmas game a couple of years ago, and it wasn't even as loud as it was then. You know, it was absolutely insane. I don't know what it sounded like live on television. You know, I think even if you had a surround system uh, and an entertainment center for your uh, for your watching pleasures, I don't think it had any any <laughs> any couldn't hold a handle candle to what we were able to see there. I mean, it was absolutely insane. The atmosphere was insane. Um, I've never seen Steelers Nation that pumped up uh, for a game, especially in the crunch in the late in the fourth quarter, like what we saw on Sunday. Yeah, you know, I was gonna say I was gonna say something about your watching pleasures, but I I would rather not know. <laughs> That's like almost I I feel like Brian now, uh, with you know his his mind in the gutter at times. Um, yeah, I mean I don't want we're not gonna sit here and rehash today a, a lot of the things that uh, Brian and Noah and even myself via being uh, on the road um, uh, about that game. We'll talk a little bit about maybe some of the adjustments and things that we saw, but the topic of the day is definitely um, this is either going to make some people laugh, maybe for the right or wrong reason, or other people might be angry, right or wrong reason, but we were trying to figure out why anyone would ever want to get rid of Mike Tomlin. I mean, you remember when the offense used to, like, not do what they're supposed to do. And I mean, they score 14 points here and there's, there's a turnover and there's this, that, or the other thing. And, and all the stuff that happened with the previous three weeks of losses, that would have been fire Todd Haley, like territory. Now it's like fire Keith Butler, fire Mike Tom. I guess it's just fire anyone except for the players who actually go on the field and execute. And, you know, I, I know I'm going right into your wheelhouse here, Zach, because we talk about, we've talked about this many, many, many times, but today, uh, Coach T is definitely uh, definitely on our minds. Yeah, you know, I, I again, I will always, always, always be a big believer in the fact that coaches coach and players play. And quite frankly, it's one thing if you look at the fact that the game plan is sketchy, 
but there's so many times, you know, where you look at what's going on in the field. I don't have a complete issue, at least offensively, um, with what's going on from time to time. You know, if the players don't go out there and execute, that's on them. They're, you know, the coaches would love to go and put the pads back on and play another round of football. You know, that, and I think anyone who's ever played the game um, typically has that itch, you know, that they want to get back out there and, and perform. But these guys are pros. Everyone in the NFL is a professional that deserves to be there, whether, you know, us uh, people on our couches say otherwise. You know, these guys deserve to be there. Um, if they don't go out there and execute, no matter how solid your game plan is, no matter how weak your game plan is, you know, if you're, it's not going to get, that's not going to happen for you. I look at a guy like Mike Tomlin, you know, he's taken a lot of slack over the years. Um, you know, you look at his Super Bowl performances, playoff performances. Um, you know, everyone likes to sit there, stare and point as if, you know, guys like, uh, you know, Sean McVay are going to make the Super Bowl every year of their career or, you know, guys like Pete Carroll have been there every single year, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I think we've seen to forget that Mike Tomlin <laughs> has been there more than most coaches in the league have been. But, you know, I understand the frustrations with fans because the Steelers have a very talented roster. Um, but I think you still have to look at the fact of what Tomlin brings. You know, it, it takes a lot to have a guy that the players will follow to the ends of the earth and play with. I mean, you see what's going on in Arizona right now. There's all these reports coming out about, you know, the Cardinals not particularly following along with Steve Wilkes, and they might be canning him after his first year in Arizona. You know, albeit they didn't have that great of a year, but they had a rookie quarterback, but the, the team's not buying in. You know, we can sit here and say all the time how, oh, Mike Tomlin's lost the locker room, but the guys will follow him to the ends of the earth. They do polls every year with these college prospects. Which coaches in the NFL would you like to play for? And the top two guys always, or top three guys always, are Bill Belichick, Pete Carroll, and Mike Tomlin. So, I mean, that has to say something as much as we want him gone and people think you need a fresh face in there. If they ever go and take that route, I don't think it's after, at least until after Ben retires. And I think that's still, you know, maybe a couple years away. But I've never understood it. There's a lot of other coaches that should be and deserve to be on the hot seat before Tomlin would even consider it. And, the way I look at it, you know, you have to gauge it based on would the guy get hired again? Yeah, I think Tom will have another job lined up the second he even walked out of the facilities on the south side. So, you know, to say that he needs to be gone and it's not worth anything as a head coach, I think is asinine. No, he would be like Devon House who showed up uh, the previous off season and, and had another job while he was still in the building. <laughs> I mean, if you remember that story. Man, you mentioned – oh, you mentioned so many things and so many names and I'm not even sure we're going to jump around like – all over the place. Uh, it, there's no. Th this is not by accident that we waited. This was a topic we were thinking about a week or two ago, and I'm like, you know what? We got to wait until let's see what happens with this New England game uh, because I have a good feeling about it, and I'm probably you know the only one who did. And it was just, uh, it's one of those things, even, you know, if Tomlin, if they don't come through with that game, everybody would still be calling for his head. And, you know, now that he comes through, there's people that just, you know, they make up all of these other excuses. Oh, the team has so much talent. Zach, how exactly does a team have all of this talent or be so talented and also suck at drafting? Because that's the other thing I hear. This is like, this is going to like dovetail into just Yinzer logic for the entire duration of this episode because, um, you know, oh, they draft so bad. And you go back and you look at, uh, you know, don't look at rookies this year, even though <clears throat> Jalen Samuels, <clears throat> Terrell Edmonds, uh, James Washington is just showing up now too. And uh, uh, Chuk Sakura for playing uh, at points. And I mean, geez, I've already named like four guys and you still don't even know where Mason Rudolph's going to be in this equation when we you know three four years from now looking back on this you look back last year and you got people crying that TJ Watt and Juju Smith Schuster just got snubbed for the Pro Bowl and it's like well, wait a minute I thought uh, I thought these guys sucked at drafting players I'm going to get somebody that's going to come out and be like Bud Dupree and Artie Burns blah blah blah, blah. yeah but you know what uh, when those picks don't work you still got to do something with the talent that you have. And Mike Tomlin and, and company and his front and this front office and his coaching staff find and develop players such as Alejandro Villanueva, such as Roosevelt Nix, undrafted guys, uh, LJ Fort, for example, or, you know, they, they find, oh, they don't, they don't get involved in free agency or, you know, they don't make any moves, but they go out and get an Vance McDonald or a Ryan Switzer or Eli Rogers. Here's another guy I could talk about undrafted and develop 
developed as as a talented player. And okay, granted, a lot of people are going to say, well, Mike Tomlin inherited. This is the other one, the Yenzer logic. He inherited Bill Cowher's players, and we were just talking about this because Bill Cowher went like what eight and eight in his final season. He uh, was eight. Yeah, and then you know Tomlin didn't. He went to the playoffs his first year, but he didn't win it all. Okay, he inherited Troy Polamalu. He inherited Ben Roethlisberger. He inherited uh, Heath Miller. Those those er- early mid to whatever two um, thousands draft picks. Heinz Ward. Those teams evolved over time. Uh, where you know you didn't have Jerome Bettis when Mike Tomlin went to the uh, Super Bowl. Uh, you didn't have uh, James Harrison wasn't a starter. Uh, he couldn't even make Bill Cowher's squads, and, and he became a starter. You didn't have guys like Ryan Clark that were brought in. You had Bryant McFadden and Santonio Holmes who were just merely rookies and weren't receiving playing time. Heck, you didn't even have Lawrence Timmons or Lamar Woodley even on the team. They were they were Tomlin's first draft. And there's countless other cases that we could point out like that, like this, such as the Antonio Browns and Mike Wallace's and Emmanuel Sanders and guys such as that Nate Le'Veon Bell. Ugh, I can't believe I just said that. But anyways, I, I digress. I mean, it's just it's one of these things where guess what? That is the coaching. Yeah, I mean, first off, it's it's which which one do you want to go with? Is it do they to draft well, or do they have you know no talent and terrible at drafting? It's always been an argument of mine that I've hated. You know, you can't have both. You can't be terrible at drafting and then also have all this talent, especially when your team that's is relatively un, inactive um, when it comes to free agency, meaning that they're not the Jaguars or Giants that spend 154 million dollars on their defenses. You know, so you can't have both. If you look at the core of this team, I mean, most of the guys on both sides of the ball, whether they're good or average, or people want to you know run them out of town with pitchforks and torches. You know, they they're guys that have been brought in by this Tomlin Colbert regime. You know, I think that's a big part that gets missed too is that Colbert has been consistent through, you know, the better part of the last 20 plus years. So having him there along with Tomlin, that does well. And, you know, I, I know I've said in our back channels numerous times, um, me being as infatuated as I am with the draft process, you know, if you nail, if, if a draft class as a whole, is has, has like about 30 percent 35 percent effective in the league like pro bowlers and you know just consistent starters that are halfway decent that's a pretty strong class especially if it's the front end of the draft and so many teams miss on these guys where in the moment it seems like they're fantastic like i look back to jarvis jones i understand people will be quick to pull out his measurables and the metrics and the test numbers and how they weren't up to snuff compared to the production he put up at Georgia. But at the time, very few people complained about the Jarvis Jones pick. The biggest issue with him was the medical red flags, but yet in the moment, no one had an issue with it. But now we go back and we look at it, you know, what else would you want to have done in that situation? Because at the time it made sense. You can't go back and then say, oh, the Steelers are terrible at drafting. They should have known he was going to be a bad prospect. Drafting is just as much as a roll of the dice and a, you know, throwing stuff at the wall and hoping something sticks as much as it is having the coaching to bring it out. So I'm not going to look at that as a big issue. Just do the fact that that's just the nature of the league. The draft is not a perfect science. And just because a guy goes to one team and doesn't have success doesn't mean he can't be successful in the NFL because sometimes it's not the right fit for him. You know, he ends up not being the type of player he thought he was. Sometimes that fresh new scenery and a new coaching a new coaching staff talking in your ears could help bring out the best in you. So I'm not going to sit here and say that one guy is better or not just because of the fact that we want to. And I look at like the Artie Burns situation because, you know, I've gone to the ends of the earth for Artie Burns to defend him. I'm going to continue hoping for the best with him either in Pittsburgh or elsewise because I still think he has enough potential and raw talent to at least develop into an average starter, which I know – well, those who live up to his first round billing. Well, quite frankly, I don't care. I mean, you see guys like DHB and Tyson Alavala who have been in the league now for, you know, 10 years and they're still playing, even though they never lived up to the first round billing. But a guy like him, you know, the team people wanted the Steelers to draft a cornerback and everyone was begging Mike Tomlin, go after a tall, long, athletic cornerback. And the Steelers finally do that, even though most people wanted William Jackson the third. And they got a guy that most people thought. A lot, a lot of them, at least, thought could slip in the back half of the first round early on in the second round, which means, in my eyes, that's not a reach. And if you look at the cornerbacks that came after that, Xavier Howard's a pro bowler this year, and that's about it. You know, you can make an argument that James Bradbury for the Panthers has done halfway decently, but even he has been, you know, an average starter at best. So, really, the only other argument you can make is that the Steelers should have gone with Xavier Howard, but had the Steelers taken Xavier Howard at that slot, at 25 in 2016, everyone would have been up in arms about that. You know, everyone 
likes to look at the draft as in hindsight, well, the Steelers should have done this or a team should have done that. You have no way of knowing what these players are going to. So appreciate the fact that a team like the Steelers have built the core of their team from the draft, sitting through the bargain barrel of undrafted free agents like Mike Hilton, Alejandro Villanueva, Matt Filer, um, BJ Finney, Eli Rogers, all these guys that have been nobodies that have become prominent starters, or in the case of Alejandro Villanueva, a Pro Bowl caliber uh, offensive tackle. Appreciate the fact that they're able to do this because half the teams in the league, including a team like the Patriots, who have been abysmal drafting in years past, um, have been able to find this talent. And in my mind, that's not an easy task to do. And that should and Tomlin and Colbert should be appreciated more for what they're able to do in that realm. Abysmal to some degree with the Patriots because it's more or less like they're um, they would rather take somebody who's been in the league, but like you said, wasn't the right fit and not finding success with yes. a, with one team and ship away a draft pick and bring them in. There's countless, countless players they've done like that or pick someone up off the trash heap this year, uh, famously Josh Gordon, for example, and try and fit him into that Patriot way, LeGarrette Blunt. That's the way they kind of you know operate up there. They do find some guys like Patrick Chung, for example, or uh, Gronk, and you know Gronk's a guy that everyone missed on to what, second round pick i mean <laughs> you know it's it's one of those things I, I love what you just said with the Artie burns thing though because everyone was crying take a corner take a corner and that's because don't take an undersized guy because they're frail and get hurt like you know senquez golson was stink bitten who thought that he was going to get hurt like that and who thought that his college teammate would be the guy that's on the team now and performing at a high level in mike hilton uh, it's just you know that's kind of the crazy talk and we're going to talk some more about you know the patriots and draft and things as we bounce around with all of this. Uh, just, you know, I, I, I look overall, well, I'm going to bring up one of the names that you ended up, uh, well, I got a couple of them. Uh, you know, Mike McCarthy floats around here in everyone's names now. That that was the thing. As soon as he gets canned from Green Bay, it's like, oh, well, we can upgrade with, with you know, some one man's trash is another man's treasure. Well, you know, not all of the time. And, uh, you know, McCarthy had uh, swung and missed many uh, several times with – losing seasons and not making the playoffs. And you want to talk about a guy who, um, you know, you're going to say that Mike Tomlin inherited Ben Roethlisberger, for example. Well, this guy has Aaron Rodgers and has Aaron Rodgers for, what, his whole coaching stint maybe, you know, or, or no. Uh, he started just at the tail end of uh, Brett Favre and, and then started off with Aaron Rodgers, so McCarthy had been doing it just a little longer. He had been around since 06, and you see some of the things that he did. His uh, first year with Rodgers was like 6-10, and 10, you know what I mean? One of those years, his first year coaching was like 8-8. Eight and eight. And yeah, okay, they got a Super Bowl win o over the Steelers, but that's the only Super Bowl they've appeared in. It is not an easy thing to do. You mentioned Pete Carroll. Pete Carroll's a guy who started he, – he went one and done. You're talking about Steve Wilkes. One and done with the Jets, 6-10 and 10 in 1994 as a full-time head coach. Goes to the Patriots to replace Bill Parcells. Does not have a losing season, by the way. Goes 10-6, and 9-7, and seven, and then 8-8. Eight and eight. And then that was it. They replaced him with Belichick, and you know – most of these people probably wouldn't understand or, or, or realize this, but Belichick, this was his second coaching job after coaching the Cleveland Browns to such illustrious records in 1991 at six and ten, seven and nine, seven and nine. His lone uh, playoff stint, postseason uh, stint with five years with Cleveland before they end up moving, and then they can him. So he goes eleven and five, and then five and eleven, and that's the same record he had his first year with the New England Patriots. And then, as luck would have it, Drew Bledsoe gets hurt. Tom Brady is discovered and you know this whole dynasty if you want to call it even if you throw up in your mouth a little bit is born and it kind of reminds me of I made a comparison like this I did this on Twitter I think during the summer and then I had a, a accompanying article and I think I actually talked about this on the podcast during the summer was there was one guy that really reminds me of Mike Tomlin and it really infuriates some people that I bring this up but I put four I think it was four of the last five Hall of Fame coaches at least up until that point I don't remember who just went in in August there might be another one but four of the five Hall of Fame coaches most recent that had gone in were Marv Levy, um, Tony Dungy, and then let me think here, Bill Parcells, the big tuna, 
and then uh, John Madden. And I asked who won the most Super Bowls out of these coaches. And there were people who actually picked Marv Levy, by the way, and he had never won a Super Bowl. <laughs> he went to four of them with the Buffalo Bills and had never won. Madden only had one. Dungy only has one. And then, uh, of course, Dungy was fired from one team, the Buccaneers, had to go over to the Colts. Look what he had with the Colts. He had Peyton Manning. You know what I mean? He had guys like Marvin Harrison, Edron James, and uh, you know guys of this caliber. And uh, he only gets one that entire time uh, with the Colts. And then, uh, and of course, um, John Madden only has one. And his Raiders, they played in the same conference with Chuck Knoll's Pittsburgh Steelers. And it's very much the same uh, type of scenario where Mike Tomlin has to deal with Bill Belichick and his Patriots are akin to Chuck Knoll and the Steelers as John Madden and the Raiders are akin to Mike Tomlin and, and the Steelers in this present day too because they're playing in the same conference. They're competing with one another and only one of those teams could ever get to the Super Bowl. Now, it's not like they're always competing in the AFC Championship or whatever, but, you know, uh, I'm not going to get into any more Patriots crap with this because we're talking about Tomlin. But, I mean, very similar, like Madden with a lot of wins and just, you know, just the one set of hardware to show for it. And, I mean, is it really that bad? Because, I mean, Bill Cowher only has one piece of hardware as well. Yeah, I think, you know, I think a lot of the people that complain about Tomlin are complaining about the things that are the small details, like the time management, you know, the um, air quoting, the inability to make changes and in in-game adjustments and whatnot. But when you look at just the success of the teams, I mean, honestly, I'd be amazed if we ever saw a dynasty again like the Patriots have had with Bill Belichick and Tom Brady. It's just not – it's it's so rare. I mean, when you have the best quarterback in, of NFL history with the best head coach in NFL history, you know, having them be in the same team for this long of a period of time, I mean, it's just the odds of that happening are so infinitesimal. So, you know, again, they're the, as far as I'm concerned, Belichick and the Patriots over the last 20 years have been the outlier, not the norm. You know, you look at guys like uh, even current day, a, a Sean Payton type who's had Drew Brees for the entire time. I mean, before this past year when they ended up making it to the uh, uh, divisional round in the NFC, they went three straight years without making the playoffs. I mean, that, that's to me, a, a, Drew Bre- a Drew Brees-led team who, yes, didn't have all the weapons he currently has now or the balance in the run game but and didn't have the greatest defense. I mean, the, it's still Sean Payton and still Drew Brees missing the playoffs three years in a row, but there were no calls for anything with Sean Payton, who has made some, you know, questionable calls over the years. You know, I think it's perfect. You know, I, the, the Tony Dungy comparison is my biggest thing because the, the Colts teams of the early 2000s were such a balanced rosters on both sides of the ball, and they have one Super Bowl to show for it. And honestly, it was whenever they were on the tail end of that entire, you know, quote-unquote dynasty, and they got that finally got that one against the Bears. You know, and it, to me, that's a, that's a disappointment as well. And yes, the Patriots were a big um, block for them to get over the hump, but they still weren't able to do it. The, the expectation that the Steelers have all this talent on both on on offense at least, and have had talent on defense, and should be winning more Super Bowls than they are. You know, I understand the frustration. I'd love to see Super Bowl come back to Pittsburgh, but to just automatically assume that it's because of a waste of talent and that we're wasting these golden years with Ben and AB and whomever, you know, to me, it's not reasonable to consistently expect that. I think a lot of that stems from the fact that as Steelers fans, we are a very spoiled fan base, whether people want to admit that we are not because of the glory days of Chuck Knoll, you know, the success that they have had with um, in the two thousands, you know, making three Super Bowl appearances and, uh, whatever time frame, 2005 to 2011, you know, that's an impressive streak there, and everyone wants to hold back and go back for more of that. And I get that. You get the taste in your mouth. You want more. Um, but you still have to look at all like all the, the Bill Cowher-led teams when they made it so close and Cowher couldn't close and get done. You know, how many AFC championship games, how many divisional round games where he got there and just floundered. And I understand, you know, realistically, I guess you can make the argument that the talent wasn't there um, in the 90s, like, you know, it was over the last decade or so, decade and a half with Tomlin. Uh, still, though, there's a, the Pittsburgh Steelers' expectations to make it, and Cowher wasn't getting the job done. And I have a feeling, and I've been saying this for a couple years now, I predict that whenever Tomlin does end up leaving the Pittsburgh, whether it's on his own accord or because he gets fired, whoever comes in next, you know, there might be some times where there's the argument made, oh, we're playing. he's winning with Tomlin's players, and – you know, we look back 10 years later, like, oh, you know, Tomlin was a great coach. 
I'm, I can already hear it now. I can hear the the <laughs> yeah. coming out and saying it. But we'll be sitting there saying, "Man, Tomlin, what a guy!" You know, that's a Hall of Fame coach, just the same way they say about Bill uh, Bill Bill Cowher. You know, so. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not going to try <laughs> to rationalize with Ian's or logic because in my mind, Tomlin is a great coach. I understand the frustrations and how there's some boneheaded uh, decisions that get made. And I'll say this as well. If those decisions he ends up making end up paying off, we don't even have this conversation. It's because they don't pay off that they're even an issue. Um, everyone is in their armchair GMs and core uh, coaching positions from their living rooms that, you know, have exactly zero years of coaching experience are quick to point out the flaws with these coaches, um, particularly Mike Tomlin. But to me, you know, I, I still make the argument he's a top five coach in the NFL. Um, I think you can reasonably make it when you look at the consistency of it, not one of these flavor of the, the year coaches like Sean McVay or Doug Peterson, who I do believe um, – are great coaches at this point. I'm not going to put them in the top tier because for the same reason with players, I need to see more than just one or two years of production before I start anointing you anything. You know, I still think he's up there. I think beyond Bill Belichick and, you know, maybe a Pete Carroll, I'm not sure of any other coaches in the league that right now that have been there and done that, that aren't the brand new coaches um, who I would take. You know, I understand that, you know, Matt Nagy and uh, Sean McVay and Doug Peterson, you know, these guys are like the, the fresh new coaches that everyone wants to talk about. But that's my argument with like a guy like Sean McVay. I mean, the, the Rams roster is about as much close to an all-star roster as you can make. And, you know, they've played very well this year. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be amazed at all if they don't make it to the NFC Championship game. They get upset by a team like the Bears or something like that in the divisional round. Because I just I don't I just don't have a good feeling about them. But yet, when are we going to sit there and say, "Well, Sean McVay had all this talent and he didn't get any Super Bowl wins"? I mean, he very well might, and I hope he does because I like Sean McVay. But are we going to have the same argument with Sean McVay at that point? Or are we going to just rub it off and say, "Well, he was a young coach who didn't do anything"? Because I hate to break it to people, it wasn't him that drafted uh, Jared Goff. That was Jeff Fisher. You know, Jeff Fisher of all coaches is one that brought in uh, Jared Goff. And a lot of that roster was brought in by Jeff Fisher. I understand that McVay brought in all these extra pieces and talent, you know, bringing in guys like Dominic and Sue, uh, Marcus Peters, Akeem Tlaib. I get that. And obviously having Wade Phillips as your D coordinator helps immensely as well. But if they don't get any Super Bowls out of this roster they have in this really kind of shrinking window due to the fact that some guys are going to need to get paid, are we going to look at Sean McVay as being a bust of a coach because he didn't make it to the promised land? I would hope so if we're going to hold other coaches like Mike Tomlin to that standard. Oh, man. Oh, man. So, so, so much. So much. So much there. <laughs> Where do I start? I want to go back to Bill Cower for a second because Bill Cower takes over for Chuck Knoll, and he has six straight years of making the postseason, of which uh, none of them yielded a Super Bowl despite being first place back in the old AFC Central, no less. Uh, you know, 11-5, and 9-7, and seven, that was the one year he went uh, – he was second in the division, wins the division the next four years, 12-4, and 11-5, and 10-6, and 11-5. And, and of those those four – last four there is loses in the AFC Championship, loses in the Super Bowl, loses the divisional game, loses in the AFC Championship. Yet again, with, a, you know, a mis- mismatch of all kind of things, they were always looking for quarterbacks. I mean, you got everyone from he who shall not be named uh, who played in the said Super Bowl and made Larry Brown a star, uh, all the way to Mike Tomzak, uh, Kent Graham. Oh, man, that brings some memories back to some people. Uh, good old Cordell Stewart, and then you kick it back to Tomzak again, and you can't figure out who who's playing. And then Cord- Slash is back at being a quarterback. And Slash actually had some good years there right at the tail end of Three Rivers and the opening of Heinz Field. And they were back to their first place ways. But there were three seasons there where Coward didn't make the playoffs. And he was 7-9, and 6-10, and ten, and 9 and seven, and there was some patience. There was some patience with all of that, and there was still some more patience because you get Tommy Maddox, and then all of a sudden, 2003, the last time the Steelers have had a losing season, the, you know, they go six and ten, and then all of a sudden they're back to uh, losing in the AFC Championship in 2004, and then finally winning a Super Bowl in 2005 as uh, Bettis uh, rides off into the su- sunset there, splits some time with uh, fast Willie Parker. Ben Roethlisberger, of course, was uh, uh, instrumental in all of this, and Ben wasn't even supposed to be any more than the, thir- the third string quarterback at this point. Tommy Maddox loses his job. Tommy Maddox wanted to get paid and all this stuff. And it's like, I- I'm sure if we had social media, 
media back then that people would have been I could not imagine some of the comments that would be going on these clowns don't know what they're doing pay Tommy pay, pay the Tommy gun pay the Tommy gun you know I could see it in the same way as like a Lev Bell it's like you know um, it was some silly stuff you know what I mean and uh, do you hold cow- against Cower that he only won one Super Bowl I just named a bunch of uh, your more recent you know Super Bowl uh, one time winners or Parcells didn't win with the Patriots at all. He he had two, and he won them both with the Giants. Um, who else did I say? Marv Levy didn't win one, and Tony Dungy just had one. Oh, you know what? I had Tony Dungy up here, and I was looking at him just to clarify. He takes over with the Colts for Jim Mora playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite lines of all time. And I mean, this guy from 2002 to 2010, though the Colts in general, because Jim Caldwell takes over, uh, the, uh, you know, the final three year or two years of Peyton Manning, I'll say three years, but you know, he had his neck injury. That's when they were rolling out there with Curtis Painter and they ended up, uh, tanking the season for Andrew Luck. Uh, but Tony Dungy here, I mean, he rips off, uh, playoff appearances from 2002 through 2008 and comes away with exactly two Super Bowl appearances and winning only one of those, and he's in the Hall of Fame. I mean, this is he's considered a Hall of Fame coach. So you get a guy like Mike Tomlin who hasn't had a losing season, who has, uh, what does he have here now, 124 victories, 655 average, 124, 65, and 1 Oh, that Browns game, man! <laughs> it's gonna just stick. It's gonna like haunt haunt us forever. Having to to, to say that one uh, in twelve seasons, and that's up there with who else was up there like that? Like Don Shula, and um, I'm thinking there was a, a Redskins coach, and now it's uh, I don't think it was was it Joe Gibbs? I I, I can't think because uh, you know the Redskins in the '80s had very strong teams too, and I'm trying to think who it was that all that had that had that pedigree of like the hundred wins in their first ten seasons coaching, and you know it was Madden Shula, and I'm trying to think there were maybe one or two others. Yeah, I, believe, been, I believe I believe it was Joe Gibbs, if I'm not mistaken. I believe so too. I would have I'm going to have to double check on that, but. You have some very good coaches in the NFL, and you have a lot. And, you know, we kind of wanted to go through this just because, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to get everyone that – I don't know if we necessarily want to change your mind. Everything, everything when you see it in hindsight is something where you're like, okay, that was a boneheaded move. But in that moment of time, even trying to defend the use of timeouts and whatnot against the Raiders at the end of the game – at that moment of time, you're making calculated risks. And, you know, they've got analytics guys and everything like this now that crunch numbers and, and uh, you know, they assess uh, what you're, you're pretty much your uh, – what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, you know, when you roll the dice and you, however many times out of ten you're going to roll a three or something like that. I can't think of the word. It begins with P. Cannot think of the word. Uh, probability. They have a probability for this. And – this is what they're going on. They they, they know this. They, they've I don't know if they I don't know if they run simulations or anything, but they they, they kind of have some educated guess to this, and it's not always going to work out in someone's favor. You think Bill Belichick honestly thought that Brady wasn't going to go down the field and win them the game on Sunday? I mean, he put the ball in his hands. I mean, this is this is what these teams do. Tomlin thought the same thing. I got Ben Roethlisberger. He's thinking the same thing's going to happen. And the teams, the players, still have to execute. You can't have this. Was the one game here, Zach, where Chris Boswell misses a field goal and Ben throws a pick. And and they actually didn't lose the game because the defense ends up getting a splash play for a change. And it's just it's one of those things. But we were going to go through and we were going to name, I guess they're in alphabetical order by team, so this should be fun, coaches you would rather have besides Mike Tomlin, current head coaches in the NFL. So that doesn't mean we're going to say Mike McCarthy, Bruce Arians, or Hugh Jackson. (laughs) Speaking of which, how bad is that? You want to talk about now, there's a legitimate turnaround. I mean, when the guy wins like one, what, one in, I don't even know what he was, 34 or something like that, uh, wins one game in like two and a half seasons, you you pretty much put like, you know, like a a zoo animal with a balloon tied to it and put put it out there and it might do a better job. (laughs) I mean, and now Hugh Jackson goes to Cincinnati and he's, you know, dragging them down. 
and, and we're going to bring up some of these coaches that have been around for a while and ask what have they ever done or done lately. So you got Steve Wilkes, who we've already talked about, uh, one year so far with the Arizona Cardinals, and they are what here? Uh, this is actually not current. I'm actually looking this up off of Wikipedia just so I have the full list here. Uh, they've played more than, th- than uh, 12 games. So these, yeah, they're 3-11. Th- three, three and 11 now it says three and nine so can't go with all of this sorry folks it's the the nerds aren't up and zach hasn't been back on wikipedia to fill this stuff out lately <laughs> sorry throw you under the bus uh dan quinn with the atlanta falcons mm, you know they got to a super bowl and now it's kind of uh, sketchy there and then you want to talk about a team with a lot of talent that's uh injuries as well, underachieving. John Harbaugh with the Ravens. You're going to have a quarterback controversy there. I always thought John Harbaugh was a pretty fine coach. I don't know how you feel, but uh, I don't know if I'd want him in place of Mike Tomlin or not. Their teams are just kind of structured differently because this is almost like the Bill Cowher type thing where it's almost stacked so heavy on the defensive end that they don't have enough uh, anything, salary cap or draft picks, used on the offensive side of the ball. Yeah, no, I like John Harbaugh. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take him over Tomlin. But he, if he's also my head coach, I'm not sitting there screaming for him to get out. You know, I understand he's been on the hot seat. Um, I think more so in the media than he has been with the actual Ravens ownership. Um, but you know, he, I, I think snagging a guy like Lamar Jackson shows that they recognize the fact they need to make a change on offense, and they found some pieces here and there to kind of complement the defense. So you know, I think because of the success we've seen with Lamar Jackson recently, I think that's a saving grace for him and his job. Moving forward, I know there's been some rumors of him going back down to college, but I'm not buying it right now. I, I, I So my point is I like John Harbaugh. I wouldn't take him over Tomlin, though, at this point. Teams are competitive. They, they show fire in the games they lose, maybe close. And, he, you know, they've been snake bitten with injuries out over the last few seasons. I can't believe I'm defending the Ravens, but you know what? Um, you know, I'm a little high from the Patriots win. So, <laughs> but hey, you know what? He, his teams, uh, they've won a Super Bowl, that one AFC championship, uh, two, two uh, division championships, six times in the playoffs since he became coach in 08, in the same division as the Steelers, mind you. Buffalo Bills and Sean McDermott. Um, man, they really uh, pulled the rug out from under this poor guy. So I'm going to say that's an incomplete. Let's go over to the Carolina Panthers, who we were just talking about in the back, back channels. You think Ron Rivera even still has a job at the end of this season? Because uh, 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 so one, uh, three division championships, uh, the one Super Bowl appearance, four playoff berths since 2011. Yeah, I mean, I think Ron Rivera is a fine coach, but I think if we're looking at the consistency of guys who – should be on the hot seat before we even have a conversation about Mike Tomlin. You know, Ron Rivera, I think, with the exception of that one, you know, stellar year where they go to the playoffs, and it almost seemed like it was destined that Peyton Manning was going to go on, on go out on top, similar to Ray Lewis and similar to Jerome Bettis, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, the lose that game wasn't really a surprise, but you know, everyone was looking at the NFL. So, what have you done for me lately, league? And with the exception of a couple, you know, you know, four playoff berths since 2011, that's not bad. But the teams have underwhelmed. And when you have a first overall pick like Cam Newton, who is his nickname Superman for a reason, you know, he's a good good quarterback. I'm not going to say he's necessarily elite. I wouldn't put him in my top five, and that's typically where I had the cutoff for elite quarterbacks. But he's a starting NFL franchise quarterback, and you know, and to be as underwhelming as they have, especially with some of the talent they've had on defense. I'm not saying Ron Rivera is going to be fired or should be fired, but I think his seat should be warming up. If you know, you look at how abysmally they've played over recent weeks, you know, but yet no one's running the with pitchforks and torches for Ron Rivera. But you know, who am I? I don't know. Booger McFarland sure sounded like he wasn't too thrilled with him on Monday night. <laughs> um, Matt Nagy, we say incomplete rookie coach with the Chicago Bears, doing a fine job thus far. Marvin Lewis has never done a fine job. Well, I guess he's won the AFC North four times since 2003, including uh, seven postseason appearances and exactly zero playoff wins. Uh, I'm not even going to ask you, Zach. That's just <laughs> – let's yeah, move I- my opinions are pretty clear on that. <laughs> Greg, Greg Williams, uh, interim coach of the Cleveland Browns, uh, got them a little turned around. Here's another guy that's been around since Shep was a pop. Jason Garrett, uh, two division titles, two postseason berths. Yeah. I, you want to talk about a guy I, that I don't know, I understand how he continues to keep a job now. They 
rightfully so, the ship has turned around and they might be in the driver's seat of that division by virtue of Alex Smith getting breaking his leg with the Redskins and the Eagles. I don't whatever the Eagles decided to. I don't know. They're still partying uh, with that Super Bowl hangover or whatever. But uh, yeah, Jason Garrett. Mm, mm, yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I said to you before we start uh, uh, recording, you know, he's, he's one of these guys that, you know, he Jerry Jones loves him. And, you know, as much as we want to look at Jason Garrett as a coach, he's a puppet. No one's going to change my mind. Jerry Jones is still the pulse <laughs> of that organization. And Jason Garrett's just a figurehead that is on the sidelines, you know, chewing his bubble gum and making hand gestures. So I, I think um, he, he's a head coach who doesn't do a whole lot of head coaching. And I think he's only there out of your, virtue of the fact that, you know, he wins just enough games most years, and he has a young, talented roster, you know, with guys like that offensive line and Dak Prescott, Zeke Elliott making the trade for Amari Cooper. Um, but he, he gets he gets enough wins every year to keep himself getting contract extensions, even though, you know, he's done nothing to warrant them. You know, I think you want to look at a guy, again, like Mike Tomlin, who at least has been there and done that, whether, you know, whether you look at the recent success or not. You know, I don't understand how Jason Garrett still has a job either. But, Speaking yeah, of that, problem. I ran into someone. I shared this with you. What was it on, like, Facebook or something? And somebody was like, he hasn't won a play- – Tomlin hasn't won a playoff game since 2011, which would have been the 2010 season, obviously, because 2011 was the Tebow debacle with the new overtime rules, uh, right? Yeah. I had that right. Or the 2011 yeah. season or whatever. So yeah. the 2010 season, which would have been when they went to the Super Bowl and lost to the Packers, and I'm like – he just played in the AFC Championship like two years ago, man. I mean, like, <laughs> does pe- do people have that short of a memory? I mean, it's just wow. You know, you got to win a couple of games to get into you know championship games. It just doesn't like fall into your lap. Um, let me see here. Uh, speaking of which, I think Jerry Jones reminds me very much. Uh, you could say Jason Garrett, uh, a very uh, like Darth Vader. Maybe not as cool, uh, but you know, <laughs> definitely not as cool as Darth Vader. But there's the Emperor that's behind him. That's the you know he's pulling the strings and whatnot. So uh, Vance Joseph with the Denver Broncos, I believe this will be a similar situation as what you were saying. I don't think the Elway is going to be too patient, and uh, you know, want to talk about drafting and picks that backfired. <clears throat> Paxton Lynch, um, Detroit Lions, Matt Patricia, Green Bay Packers, Joe Philbin. Um, yeah, there's nothing to say, I think, about any of those guys yet. You get down here to Bill O'Brien with the Houston Texans. They gave him an extension. And they had a little bit of patience with them. Seems like he's doing an all right job. But, it, you know, do you go with the unproven over Mike Tomlin? I'm not so sure about that. Yeah, I mean, Bill O'Brien, I put him in a similar boat to John uh, Harbaugh. He's not as proven as John Harbaugh, but I think, you know, I put him in the classification of if I have him as my head coach, I'm not getting rid of him. But I'm also not firing Mike Tomlin to acquire him either. Let me, let, I'm going to do some lightning round here on the, on the middle section here. For, uh, I'm going to skip over one or two and, and bounce back. So Frank Reich with the Colts, first year coach there. Uh, no opinion. Doug Marone, no thanks with the Jaguars. Anthony Lynn with the Chargers. Ah. Uh, what second year he was hired last year okay he's kind of in the same boat as Sean McVay let's see how, what you do Adam Gase was a very hot hire with the Dolphins and they're a 500 style club and now we boomerang back around to some of the um the old battle axes here like Andy Reid and Bill Belichick and Sean Payton and you're really talking about the guys that have been around or have had head coaching jobs uh, as long or longer than Mike Tomlin and you know it's not like Andy Reid has all of this Super Bowl success either obviously we don't need to say anything else about Belichick and uh what Sean Payton just the one <laughs> yeah i mean <laughs> Andy Reid is going to be the same. That's the same reason why I'm not picking the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl. Because, again, until they prove to me that they can do anything in the postseason and not just put up these gaudy numbers that, you know, Andy Reid led teams typically do. Because I I do believe Andy Reid might be the best offensive mind in football of our generation. Um, That's my opinion. I'm sure I'll get some flack for that. But, uh, you know, I think he uh, definitely has the the regular season accolades, but has nothing to show for them in the postseason. Um, you know, whether it's an early exit or a mid, mid, mid game collapse, you know, he's done nothing to warrant having him be the guy that you want as your head coach. And you want to talk about clock mismanagement, you know, people, Tom, Mike Tomlin gets all this slack. Andy Reid has been notorious over his career for being such a, you know, below average at best, you know, clock manager. You know, there's always the jokes about his lack of inability to call timeouts properly to and be aware of how much time's left on the clock. 
they've gotten away with it more, I think, this year because of the success they've had on offense, and they don't really have to manage the clock in as many situations. But, you know, he, he, he gets the same slack as Mike Tomlin when it comes to clock mismanagement, game mismanagement, and making some adjustments in game. But yet again, a guy who has no postseason success beyond the Eagles making the Super Bowl back in 2004 – and we're still not going to sit here and question him at all. I understand he's a you know an all time great coach by most standards. He's one of the best coaches of this generation. But there's no there's not the same criticism. But yet the success is still not there. And to me that is absolutely wild. Um, I've said my piece with Sean McVay. I think he's you know a great coach, a great offensive mind. He fits the persona of what LA is looking for in a head coach, especially being in that culture and, and that having to have that media presence. Um, but are we going to look back, you know, five, ten years from now and say McVay wasted these couple of years if the Rams don't get a Super Bowl? I think so. I mean, they had the talent last year. It wasn't like Goff was a rookie. You know, they had the talent last year to go and do it, and they lost and were one and none done in the playoffs. And I think this year could potentially be the same thing, depending on what matchup they pull up, if they end up getting a first-round bye. And, again, are we going to look at that and, and hold them to the same standard when you have all this talent? I would hope so, but we're probably not going to because – you know, Yinzers don't live in L.A. typically. Um, um, you're going to end no, up hurting so. hurting an old friend of ours, Nate's, uh, feelings if you keep talking about McVay like this. <laughs> yeah, I, I, again, I like, I like McVay, no offense, Nate, but I, uh, I, I just I, I don't understand, you know, until he proves that he does anything, why he doesn't get the same type of look. Um, and, you know, and then obviously there's Bill Belichick, who, like I said, the whole grail of coaching, you know, you know, he has the three Super Bowl losses, he has five to make up for it and wins. And then there's Sean Payton, who, like I said, again, you know, I, I would put up there as probably my – one of my favorite coaches because I've been a Saints fan for um, not as long as I've been a Steelers follower, but, you know, the Saints have always been a team I've respected, I've liked. Um, you know, I was a big fan, especially during that mid-2000s. I was a big Marquise Colston fan. I uh, look at them, and, you know, they've had this offensive firepower. You know, Drew Brees has been – you know, throwing five thousand yard seasons like they've been going out of business for years now. You know, he has he's always up there when it comes to talent. He's had weapons over the course of his career. The defense has been up and down from time to time, but for the most part, it's been stable enough to get the job done. And yet, we were just they're, they're one year removed from having three straight non playoff seasons. I'm not going to sit there and say Sean Payton deserves to be fired because he doesn't. But in that same logic, neither does Mike Tomlin. So you know, if we're not going to look at one. Too many people look at Mike Tomlin and I think the coaches in the NFL in a vacuum and, and just look at it cut and dry and not realize the fact that we treat these coaches differently. Um, Tomlin does enough to not warrant being fired. Again, I get the frustrations, but a lot of these coaches have flaws. You know, I think you look at the, the Steelers Patriots game. That was a that, that was probably the most inconsistent I've seen Bill Belichick coach because, you know, the execution was not there by the team and there were some questionable breakdowns and lack of focus that came on there that came, that everyone wants to – it's so quick to rush and blame Mike Tomlin when it happens to the Steelers, but no one's ever going to blame Bill Belichick because it's Bill Belichick. And, again, there's the double standard there. And, you know, so in my mind, there's very few coaches that we've gone over that I'm going to sit here and say, yeah, I need to have yeah. that guy over, you know – <laughs> well, we got a few more, and I mean, you know, yeah. Mike Tomlin has won the division three of the last four years, and they're currently in the lead of the division. Oh, it's eight, five, and one. I'm sorry, they don't have the Rams or the Saints record right now, and very few teams have records like that where they finish like a thirteen and three, like the Steelers did last season. And maybe it could have been that way. Maybe it could have been the other way. A lot of people forget too that last season, it's like the guy, the other guy you want to run out of town, Chris Boswell, who had to close his Twitter account because of a bunch of buffoons making all, all sorts of inappropriate comments to him publicly. It, it, it amazes me, you know. I wonder if some of these people would say some stuff. They didn't wonder Joey Porter got in fights back in the day because people probably did say stuff to his face and he didn't back down. Um, they wouldn't do it to Harrison, though, because, you know, he, you know his reputation, I think, precedes him. But uh, it just amazing, amazes me you'd want to run the guy out of town. Uh, we, we floated over Mike Zimmer with the, with the Vikings. There's a mixed bag. Pat Shermer's first year with the uh, – with the Giants, but a former head coach himself with the Browns, Todd Bowles, uh, to be determined with the Jets, uh, Chucky, John Gruden. We really can't talk any smack on Chucky because, you know, they 
they beat us. But um, would you rather prefer that? You go out and get John Gruden and he tears the entire team apart. He, he ships away your Antonio Brown or Juju Smith-Schuster. He, he ships away your T.J. Watt. <laughs> and, you're left, and, you're, and you're left with just, you know, um, uh, uh, Ben and, you know, whatever other guys that are still there. And a couple guys get hurt on the offensive line and you're, you're just in shambles. Doug Peterson had a very successful first year with the Eagles. Uh, this year they're not as successful. Kyle Shanahan has had uh, – I think there will be a lot of patience with him. I think he was one of the hot hires, hot hands out there in San Francisco. But, of course, when you lose a quarterback or two, what else are you supposed to do? He had uh, you know Jimmy G, and he doesn't have Jimmy G. Uh, Pete Carroll – you know, let's see if Pete Carroll can reload here and, uh, you know, right this ship with the Seahawks because a lot of that Legion of Boom is gone and there were people that weren't happy anymore, including Roll Thomas, who was franchise tag, got hurt, what, flipped the bird to everybody on his way out. Um, <laughs> you know, Richard Sherman goes over to the division uh, rival and, uh, you know, they've had their issues too, you know, with Beast Mode wanting a contract and Cam Chancellor and all this. So it's not exclusive to just the Steelers. Uh, Dirk Cutter, yeah, I don't see Dirk Cutter having a job with the Buccaneers next year, but stranger things have happened. Um, and then you have uh, Mike Vrabel, and then there's Jay Gruden, who's with the Redskins, and he's been there since 2014 with one uh, postseason appearance to show for it. So, I mean, those are those are all the names, Zach. I don't know if you want to float over any of those either as we get uh, – long-winded here uh there may actually be like another thing or two to cover real quick as far as the adjustments the Steelers made against the Patriots that we did want to cover as part of the Steelers grand because it's supposed to be a daily thing we went to a historical part um uh, anything on these other coaches or or nah Mm, the only other coach I think that should even be in the same breath right now is Mike Tomlin. Is uh, oh, definitely Dirk Cutter. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean Pete Carroll. I mean, other than that, I, I think Kyle Shanahan could be a, a good coach. You know, given a full season of a healthy Jimmy G, and you know we've seen them at least stabilize a little bit this year. You know, uh, George Kittle exploding, and you know other guys kind of stepping up to the plate. I think it'll be fun to see Jimmy G come back. But again, I'm not going to get rid of Mike Tomlin for what some hypothetical situation with Kyle Shanahan. So Pete Carroll is the only guy, as far as I'm concerned, in that last segment that should even be in the same breath as Mike Tomlin. So some of the things that changed, and we were sitting there, and, you, and they're saying, you know, Mike Tomlin isn't the guy who makes adjustments. And during the week, and he defended this too, by the way, after he, Artie Burns only plays three snaps and gets yanked and said, you know, that play wasn't his fault. And it was perfectly executed. We sat there in the stands. I didn't even see Hogan run the rest of that route. I didn't even stand up. Like everybody else stood up. I'm just like, yeah, I know what's about to happen. <laughs> he was so wide open. It was ridiculous. Guy hadn't done anything all year and nobody's covering him. Uh, but, you know, aside from that, like one play, you know, the adjustments in the game, and I don't know if this was mind games and more smoke and mirrors or whatever, but in, in previous weeks, like leading up, it was like one of these things where it was like either John Bostic is playing a lot of inside linebacker or LJ Ford's playing a lot of inside linebacker. And now all of a sudden it was just Vince Williams with Morgan Burnett basically playing like a dimebacker. And you, you saw Terrell Edmonds have a great game. We saw Joe Hayden play out of his mind. You didn't even hear anything on Cody Sensible's side of the field, did you? I mean, that's that, – nope. hello, those are bells and whistles for good cornerback play. Sean Davis and these guys, not giving up a whole lot of big stuff. Two catches to Gronk, one to Josh Gordon. Um, you could say the Patriots played as uncharacteristic as whatever, but – this started out, and this this was made a meal a little bit uh, based off of what Ben Roethlisberger said uh, Tuesday morning on his radio show. I guess he went to Mike Tomlin and uh, with with who Pouncey and said, you know, they talk about pregame introductions. So myself and Zach get to our seats just a, a little early, uh, just in time. I, I like to be there for the pregame ceremonies and whatever. Everyone had pretty much cleared the field from warm-ups, and all of a sudden the public address announcements like, ladies and gentlemen, the New England Patriots, uh, or the visiting New England Patriots, or however he states it. And, of course, there's some boo birds, you know. Uh, I always find that distasteful just because the other team takes the field. Who cares if they're other team? But I hate the Patriots, so I booed too. A anyways, um, and, and now, you know, they're starting to show, like, the video on the scoreboard. And, you're, and I looked over at you, and uh, what was my question? I said, do you think they announced the offense or the defense today? I'm like, who has to have the bigger day? Because this is usually how this works. And then each individual – what happens is if it's the defense, for example, each individual player will come out up until the very end. It's usually your captain, like Cam Hayward, will be the final guy that gets announced coming out of the tunnel or – it's Ben if it's the offense. And then all of a sudden they just said, ladies and gentlemen, you're Pittsburgh Steelers. 
and the, and they all took the field. All, and we're we're looking to see which was going to be offense or defense. And you're like, well, there's Villanueva. He's walking over there. I'm like, well, there's two it over there. They just went straight to the sidelines. There's the guys that go down to the end zone and and take a knee for a prayer. They showed Ben taking practice snaps with Pouncey on the sideline, like like a madman. He was just it was like boom, rapid fire. You know, and there was no introductions. I don't think I've ever seen that before at Heinz Field. And we knew, okay, they announced on Saturday they are going to do the color rush, which we had no idea they were doing either. They come out with no introductions. These guys are, you know, they're playing mind games with themselves now and have, like, geeked themselves up to be all business to win the game. And it showed on the field. Whatever it need, whatever they needed to motivate themselves, aside from playing the Patriots and losing three games in a row, it worked. And you got to give credit to the veteran players on this team as well as the coaching staff, and that includes Mike Tomlin. Yeah, I mean, I I remember I was saying to you, you know, this is business, you know, because like they typically that's a fun thing is the crowd involved seeing them come out there and having all the stars, you know, line up and everyone's cheering and, you know, what have you. But, you know, having them come out there, you can tell on every single player's face that came out there was purely business. There wasn't all the jumping around like there normally was. It was just straight up going out there and you knew they came out to play. And, you know, I think. The, the quote that always bugs me the most when it comes to the conversation about Mike Tomlin is saying, well, he doesn't have the team prepared. And that always has bugged me because the people that are saying he doesn't have the team prepared are solely going based off of the notion that, oh, you know, on Sunday they lost to a team that they shouldn't have lost to or whatever, you know. But in my mind, they're in the NFL. He's an NFL coach. and they have, He has an NFL coaching staff. He's led by a 15-year veteran in Ben Roethlisberger with a – um, nine-year veteran in Antonio Brown, or 10-year veteran, 2010, however many years that is, um, in Antonio Brown. They have a veteran offensive line that's been there and done that. The, the preparation excuse, you know, you can, in my, as far as I'm concerned, you can make that argument in high school football and you have a bunch of kids that, you know, half of which will never step on a football field again in their lives. Um, you can make that argument even in some college football that there's no preparation because the guys are not professional. But this is their career to say that they're not prepared or that they were more so prepared on this game Sunday against the Patriots, I think is just reaching. Um, Cause to me, yes, they came out and I think they played probably one of the more flawless games of the Mike Tomlin era in a week where they had no other choice, but to do that. But again, that comes back to the original point a long time ago in this podcast about how players play and coaches coach and if the execution is still not there. doesn't matter how good your game plan is you're not going to have success. And I know, you know, there's times where we sit there and we scratch our heads about why they do certain things on offense or why they do certain things on defense. Um, and I get that. And again, I know a lot of that falls back on the lap of Tomlin, so I'm not excusing that. But for whatever reason, and I said this whenever the Steelers were on that six-game win streak, whenever the Steelers are winning, no one ever rushes to give Mike Tomlin any type of credit. The minute the Steelers start losing, you know, it's Tomlin's fault. Fire him. And, you know, you, again, that, that always has bugged me. So I was glad to see that when the Steelers came out, there was all business as usual. They played a very good game, especially on defense. Um, you know, I was waiting. I tweeted it out there, and I told you, and I'm sitting there waiting for Gronk to go off. I'm waiting for the Steelers oh. to make some crucial mistake. <laughs> Wait, you know, I ate my words. <laughs> I'll, de I'll definitely eat crow on that, you know, because I, I was wrong. And but I was waiting for it because I've seen it before. So I'm like, I know it's going to happen, and they didn't do that. It was the Patriots that made – all these uncharacteristic mistakes and, you know, seeing a defensive back um, intercept Tom Brady. That's, that, that's a thing you tell your grandkids, yeah. you know, you, you saw it. So to me, again, Tomlin deserves some credit for this and I still don't think he's going to get enough of it. And if the Steelers lose on Sunday to the saints, we're going to go right back to the fire Tomlin conversation. The Steelers could win the Super Bowl this year and Tomlin will not get a single ounce of credit for it. But the minute that they don't make it, we want to blame him. And it, it, to me, it's a double standard. But give credit where credit's due. And the Steelers played a fantastic game on Sunday against the Patriots, especially on defense. And a lot of that came down to just the fact that they executed well, the game plan was sound, and everyone deserves credit for that win because it was a very good team win. Yeah, um, they're just going to say that Randy Feekner allows Ben the call of the plays, and that's the reason they would have yeah, won like the Super Bowl yeah. or whatever. And uh, yeah, I actually said something I, I had tweeted out that uh, Ben Roethlisberger got snubbed from the Pro Bowl, even though he'd been there the previous, uh, selected the previous four seasons. And it's like, well, it doesn't really matter because he's not 
planning on uh, making that trip anyways. He's get, trying to go to where it's Atlanta, I believe, the yes. Super Bowl this year. So that that's where he's booking his ticket. And on the offensive side of the ball, I made mention of like Morgan Burnett playing a lot of snaps, and they're, they're doing a, they were doing a lot of things with DBs. And uh, of course, Anthony Ciccolo came in too, but that was more or less because uh, Bud Dupree got banged up in the game. Uh, but the other guys, I mean, it, it was pretty much a straight set the whole way around. I think Dan McCullers got like two snaps, and the one time, um, you know. Keith Butler sends them out there. You know, they had the Patriots backed up pretty badly in their own, uh, almost into their own end zone. And we saw that McCullers just took whoever it was and moved them about like four yards back right off the snap. The guy was like, you know, move, trying to move a mountain. Uh, he, he was a movable object. But on the offensive side of the ball, we were trying to figure out, it's like, okay, they activated Eli Rogers. This must be Ryan Switzer, you know, gets hurt in practice on Friday. Oh, great. Here's another thing to deal with. But if you have both of these guys who are basically kind of like clones as far as the type of wide receiver they are, and you got Antonio Brown who's a little smaller, you got Juju Smith Schuster, you got James Washington, you lost Justin Hunter, so really the big streaky, rangy kind of guy like you used to have like Martavis Bryant really isn't on the field unless you count, you know, Darius Hayward Bay, who, you know, doesn't get thrown the ball a whole lot because he has a reputation, so to speak, for not catching the football, and is like a special teams guy, you're like, oh man, you're in, they're in so much trouble, this is going to be a shootout, they're going to have to do all this and that, and you're trying to see how they would pull all these guys on the field at the same time, and I think it's very interesting if you have a chance to go back and, and watch this game, a few things that are different that we had not seen before, definitely putting two slot receivers basically on the outside, and, and Eli Rogers and Switzer, and then flipping them, and then you have the bunch on the other side where you put Vance McDonald on the outside. And in that point, running uh, any anyone, uh, including A.B., Juju, or even Jalen Samuels, who tends to split out more than we saw Connor do all year, probably even more capable in the passing game, to be honest. That's kind of his bag as opposed to, you know, Connor is the, you know, hit the hole and uh, make people miss and, and punish them kind of deal. But Samuels did some of that too on Sunday. I mean, this is that's a fantastic coaching job because, I mean, you're talking about a second-year player, a guy who wasn't even in training, two guys that weren't in training. Eli Rogers hadn't played all year. And, um, you know, Vance McDonald got hurt in training camp too, and he didn't have one the year before, even though he's a second-year player. He missed a lot of time last year. And you're talking about a lot of moving parts, a Matt Filer at right tackle. They put Marcus Gilbert on IR. You have a fifth round rookie who's getting uh, most of the snaps at running back. I'll tell you what, what a fantastic game plan, I, I thought. And, you know, they still left some points on the board, but you got to be happy with what, what ended up being on the board was enough to get the job done, even though you were scared, you know. You are telling me about, you know, here comes Gronk in the fourth quarter, and I think my exact phrase to you was, you ever been punched in the face at Heinz Field? And you said <laughs> yes. And you said it was a preseason game, it was by accident. And I said, well, have you ever been punched in the face during the regular season on purpose at <laughs> Heinz Field? Because it was very close to happening zach i'm telling you <laughs> yeah, i would wear it. if it would have happened you know i would have gladly taken the punch in the face but i would i was just airing my concerns <laughs> <laughs> oh that's going to be happening that's another that's a, almost a week away is the airing of grievances i think we took care of quite a bit of them here with uh coach team mike tomlin maybe we changed some minds maybe we made some more people angry and I, I know if we've got uh one particular gentleman i'll i'll protect the guilty unless you want to drop in the comments somewhere on the website uh you know he's talking about vegas lines and bookies and how the steelers lose against favor when they're favored and and win when they're not and I, like I, I don't put a whole lot of faith into the whole vegas thing i you know i don't get into sports gambling and stuff like that and it's like well the other teams are pretty consistent with whatever and i'm like well it's the national fixed league what do you want oh yeah <laughs> tinfoil hat back on that means it's about time to wrap the show then <laughs> we're, we're we're venturing off into uncharted waters international waters where we can't be prosecuted uh zach <laughs> thanks once again professor for joining me and uh yeah um hopefully the steelers can carry this momentum on into new orleans a lot of people are looking at that as being a very scary game but uh, you know what we're going to be talking to trey johnson here uh, shortly here in the in the coming days about that matchup and see what he thinks and maybe get a couple of his uh, thoughts on what the Steelers did differently, at least with scheme defensively. So we'll be covering some of that as well. I'll give Zach a chance to say his piece. And thank you once again, Zach. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be back on here. And, you know, I, I thoroughly look forward to the uh, angry comments that I expect to have coming our way because, you know, I'm a magnet. And I just attract the drama. So... <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. I hear you uh, straight <laughs> up, buddy. So um, anyways, folks, uh, that'll do it for this edition, a very long edition of the Daily Steelers Grind, Steel City Underground podcast. My name's Joe Kuzma. His name is Zach Meckler. And until next time, always encouraging our faithful uh, listeners and followers to be safe, be good, and we'll catch you later. We would like to thank you for listening and remind our listeners to follow us on social media and our website, www.steelcityunderground.com. 